This is a 1988 BMW M3, known by enthusiasts as the E30 M3, the original BMW M3, which started a lineage that continues with great success to this day. The E30 M3 is also my very favorite BMW, which is a bold claim to make, but today I'm going to review this car and explain why it's true. Before I get started, a quick reminder to check out Cars and Bids, which is my new online car auction website for modern enthusiast cars. If you have a cool car to sell from the 1980s and up, sell it with Cars and Bids, the ultimate place to sell your cool cars from the modern era. You can also buy cool cars. They're right now live for auction on Cars and Bids. We have this and this and this and many, many others that you should check out. So if you're looking to get a cool car or get top dollar for your cool car, go to carsandbids.com. I've borrowed this M3 from a viewer here in San Diego. And first, I wanna provide a little overview. The M3 is, of course, the high performance version of the popular BMW 3 Series, with M standing for motorsport. Now, the M3 has become a global icon, but it all started with this car in the 1980s. The E30 M3 made its debut in Europe in 1986, and it came out in North America for the 1988 model year. Here in North America, the original M3 had a 2.3 liter four-cylinder engine, and it made about 190 horsepower. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but this car only weighed around 2,600 pounds, which is just insanely low. Compare that to the modern M3. It has up to 450 horsepower, but it weighs a full thousand pounds more. The M3 has certainly become more powerful as it's aged, but it has also put on a lot of weight. The E30 M3 was offered as a coupe or as a convertible, although only the coupe was available here in North America. Now, the E30 M3 was sold through the 1991 model year. Eventually, BMW followed it up with the E36 M3, which brought the M3 into the mainstream, where it's been a huge success ever since. The E30 M3 is pretty rare. BMW only made about 15,000 of these for the entire world, and only about a third of those came to North America. Now, I've previously said that the BMW 1 Series M is my very favorite BMW, and I still think it's fantastic. But last year, I drove the M2 Competition and it was just better. And I realized then that BMW was still improving things in that segment. There's still room to grow. But I really don't think you can improve upon the E30 M3. Its styling, its focus, its driving experience, I just don't think it can really be matched by a modern car in today's world of technology and safety regulations. So today, I'm going to review this car and show you what I mean. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the E30 M3, and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the E30 M3 on the outside. I wanna talk about one of my very favorite things about the E30 M3, and that is how it looked. I love the styling of this car. I like all the boxy 1980s cars to begin with, but the enhancements made to this over the regular 3 Series are so nice. The flared fenders were probably the best. You had this nicely flared front fender that came out and made the car look more muscular, and same thing in the back, just a little extra flare to give it that much more muscle. Nobody is doing simple flared fenders like this anymore, but it was a great trend. It made it look like a rally car. I also liked the wing on the back. I'm not a fan of big, excessive wings, but this car didn't have that. Just this little wing, three or four inches high, that kind of gave a clue as to what it was. Another thing I absolutely loved about the outside of this car was the badging. You had an M3 badge on the trunk, on the deck lid, and you also had an M3 badge in front in the grille 
And that was it. There was no gold brake calipers with the M logo, M's on door handles and mirrors and rocker panels and basically everywhere else like so many modern M cars now. It was so subtle. You had flared fenders, the wing, some flared rocker panels down here on the sides and the front and rear M3 badges. And that was all. It was definitely a different era of performance cars and frankly, one that I liked better in terms of styling. And by the way, one other important exterior item worth mentioning with the E30 M3, it still has the BMW kidney grille, just like modern BMW models. Although here you can see it's quite a bit smaller than what you would find in the BMW M3 of today. And next up, we move on to the interior of this car. And the first thing you notice when you get into this E30 M3 is cloth seats. Now, BMW never sold this era of M3 in North America with cloth seats, but the owner of this car liked the European style cloth seats so much, he went and found the original fabric with the original pattern and had the seats completely recovered. And so this car has the European style E30 M3 cloth, which I think looks fantastic. Same deal on the door panel you have the same pattern. It all looks very nice, very matching, very period. And next we move on to one of my very favorite quirks in BMWs from this era, and that would be the check panel. If you go onto the ceiling above the rear view mirror, there's a little panel with like nine different rectangles. And this allowed you to check to see if various systems in your car were not working. The way it was supposed to work was you would press the check button and all of these lights would turn on. And then when you released the check button, if any light stayed on, then it was a true malfunction. As you can see in this car, you press check, they all light up. So every everything is working just fine for now. Now, also interesting is the fact that when you turn on the car, a little light flashes in the gauge cluster that also says check, and it flashes until you put your foot on the brake and then the checking stops. Now, I looked this up in the owner's manual and it was surprisingly unhelpful and vague about what this was doing. But again, I think it's checking various different systems and lighting up all of your gauge cluster warning lights. And then when check goes away, if any of those lights stay on, there is a true malfunction, just like the check panel on the ceiling. By the way, another interesting item in the gauge cluster, you can see there's a series of dots on the bottom in the middle. You have five kind of green dots or rectangles, then a yellow one and then a red one. This was the oil life indicator. Back before you had a screen in the gauge cluster, and when you first got an oil change, the technician would reset this indicator and it would be on the very first green bar. And then over time, as you drove, it would sort of move down towards the red. And next up, another great quirk of BMWs from this era, that would be the little panel in the center control stack that gave you various vehicle information. This was like an early version of an infotainment screen that we have today. And you could press all of these different buttons to get different information, your average miles per hour, your average fuel economy, your range, the current time, and they all had their own individual buttons. It was an interesting way to display that information, very much a predecessor to today's infotainment. Now you might be wondering what exactly are those buttons on the bottom that say 1110 I was very confused by that too. So I looked it up in the owner's manual and it turns out you use those buttons to set like the clock and the date. So for example, if you're setting the clock and it's 7.30 p.m. or 19.30 as the Germans would put it, you would press the 1000 button, then you press the 100 button nine times, that would give you 1900, then you would do the rest with the 10 and the one button. Kind of an interesting way to do it, but that's how it was done before infotainment screens. Now, speaking of individual buttons, here's another rather interesting item, the power window buttons. They're in the center and you can see there's a separate button for up and down for the windows. This is especially odd because no one else was doing this at this time. A lot of cars had power windows by 1988, but they used rocker switches pretty much like they do today. But BMW had individual up and down buttons. Seems like overcomplication, but then it is the Germans. And next up, another interesting item in this interior is the interior rear view mirror, which has a nice quirk to it. And that's the fact that it has map lights mounted on the bottom. Now, a lot of cars have that, not that interesting, but 
The unusual thing here is it also has the switches for the map lights mounted on the bottom. So every time you wanted to turn on the map light, you had to tap the bottom of the mirror. An interesting idea. You don't see that too often, but this car had it. And next up, another interesting item in this interior is the headlight switch situation. In order to turn on the headlights, you actually pull out this round dial and that turns them on. Not that uncommon for older cars, but you don't see it too often. One unusual thing here is that unlabeled button next to the light switch, which doesn't appear to have any obvious function, at least until you turn the lights on. Then it becomes clear that that button controls the fog lights. You press that and the fog lights turn on for driving in fog. And speaking of lighting, we have to talk about another interesting lighting item in this car, and that would be in the glove box where this car contains a flashlight. You can pull the flashlight out of the glove box and use it if you drop something in the car, if it's dark and you're trying to get into your house. Again, this doesn't work. This car's over 30 years old. I'm sure the bulb has burned out, but it was there and it was a pretty good idea, especially in the days before entry lighting where car lights will stay on for a minute after you turn them off so you can walk inside safely. The flashlight was pretty smart. And next up, another interesting item in the glove box. This car still has its original window sticker. It was sold new back in 1988 by Berlin Porsche Audi in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. The sticker price of this M3 was just over $35,000 back when it was new. And the owner of this car told me he paid $36,000 for it. So this car has beautifully held its value assuming you don't consider inflation at all. Also noteworthy in the glove box, you have the owner's manual and just look how tiny this owner's manual is. In the days before infotainment and gauge cluster screens and radar cruise control and all sorts of modern safety tech, this was all you needed to explain how to use a new car. Kind of hard to believe. But it is worth noting that that owner's manual specifically applied to the 3 Series in general. If you got an M3, you also got a supplementary owner's manual explaining a few other M3 features. But my favorite part is the first page. The introduction says, Dear BMW M3 driver, the pleasure of driving one of the most high quality technological achievements of the modern automobile industry is now to be yours. Seems like a little bit of hyperbole for a car that had a check panel to let you know if your brake lights were out, but that was how they introduced it. And next up, one more interior item worth noting up here. This is purely a Doug thing. I'm not sure if anybody else even cares about this, but this car has the best turn signal lever feel of any car that has ever existed. The turn signal lever feels so perfectly weighted and wonderful, and I love putting on the turn signals in this car. When I'm driving one of these, I will often put on the turn signals when no one else is around just to feel that lever. Again, that's probably only a Doug thing, but I thought it was worth mentioning. And next up, we move on to the back seats of the E30 M3. And for me, that of course means climbing into the back seats. But before I do, one interesting thing about getting into the back seats, to access them, you pull up on this little plastic lever coming out of the side of the front seats, and an interesting thing happens. The backrest goes forward, but the base of the front seat also kind of comes up to provide more room to access the back seat and make it easier. So, does it work? Well, let's find out. I pull the lever, and indeed, it is pretty easy to get back here far easier than in other cars from this era. Not surprisingly though, when you go to put the seat back in place, well, <laughs> there's not even enough room to actually latch it. So you wouldn't really want to transport adults in the back of the M3. And you can see why there was demand for BMW to create an M3 sedan, which they did for the next generation. Now, as for the back seats, as you might imagine, there's not really all that much that's notable back here. Although there are a couple of items I'll mention. One is the fact that there are only two back seats. You don't have a third middle back seat in the back of this car. Also, the back seats are pretty heavily bolstered. You have a surprising amount of bolstering on these back seats to keep you in place. I guess the idea was you might be taking rear seat passengers on the racetrack in your M3. Even the base of the rear seats is surprisingly well bolstered, which you don't often see, especially in back seats. Now, despite the giant rear seat windows back here, these windows do not roll down. So if you're a back seat passenger, you can't put your window down. Although you can open the window with this tiny little lever at the back to like open the vent, but that doesn't really do much for getting airflow back here. If you really want more air on the back seat, 
you're just out of luck. The other interesting thing I find about the back seats is on the rear shelf, and that would be the speakers in this car. These are the factory speakers, and you can see BMW didn't even attempt to integrate these into the carpeting of the rear shelf like basically everyone else does. Instead, they're just kind of stuck on there, and they curve up at the end, maybe to provide a better sound experience. But either way, not exactly the best looking things if you want kind of a clean rear shelf. And next we move on to the trunk of the M3, where there are a couple of items worth mentioning. To open it, you push on this little keyhole here, and then it pops open to this position, and then you do the rest. Now, when you open the trunk, one of the interesting things you realize is the load-in height is crazy. Because the brake lights had to stay put, and they didn't want the license plate, I guess, to go up with the trunk, in order to get anything in here, you have to lift it really high off the ground, higher than in any modern SUV. This height of trunk opening was actually pretty common in the 1980s, but it's mostly unheard of today. Automakers have figured out a way to move the brake lights more to the side and get the trunk to come further down to make it easier to get stuff in the cargo area. Next up, my very favorite thing about the trunk, that would be on the inside of the trunk lid, you have this little panel here, and when you undo the fastener for this panel, you can see that in here is a toolkit, and I've always loved the fact that when the toolkit is open, it comes down and kind of sits flat. So if you're on the side of the road changing a tire, the toolkit is sort of flat on your trunk like it would be if you had your tools laid out on a table. It's a good idea. The other thing I like about this toolkit, of course, is that all the tools say BMW. All these wrenches that have surely never been used remind you precisely which car they came from. Next up, I want to talk about the engine in the E30 M3, but first I want to discuss opening the hood, which is surprisingly unusual. There's a little latch in the driver's side footwell, just like there is in most cars, and you pull that latch, which gets you into this position. From here, it's especially weird because the hood is front hinged. So to open it, there's no further latch. You just pop it open and now you're in. Surprising, but that's how a lot of BMWs from this era had their hoods open. And next up on to the engine itself. This is BMW's S14 four cylinder. Yes, there was an M3 powered by a four cylinder engine and this was it. Like I mentioned, 2.3 liters, about 192 horsepower and torque was somewhere in the 160s pound foot range. Really not all that powerful, but again, this car wasn't all that heavy. One thing I do love in this engine is how it says BMW M power. And not just once, but twice on both sides of the engine. So it didn't matter where you were looking at it from, you knew that this car had BMW M power. The other thing I have always loved under the hood of BMW models from this era is this warning label that reminds you to use genuine BMW parts. I think this is such a charming old school warning label and the biggest mistake BMW is making as a company right now aside from the X4, is not making t-shirts out of that warning label. I think they would sell, and I absolutely love how that looks. Fantastic period warning label. And so those are the quirks and features of the E30 BMW M3. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the E30 M3. I love this car. I always have. Now for a long time, I really did say that the BMW 1M was my favorite BMW, but this isn't just like clickbait, like, oh, I have a new favorite BMW every week to get you to watch. Two things happened that changed my mind. One was I drove the M2 competition. I felt like it was better. I felt like BMW was still improving on the 1M. But the other thing is I spent more time driving these. I've driven a couple of these recently. And <sighs> I forgot how much I love this car. Now, to be clear, by modern standards, this car is not particularly fast. I bet zero to 60s in the high sixes or low sevens, but that's not what it's all about. For one thing, it's tunable. If you want to change that, you can, but it does feel really quick, and that's because there's not much car involved here. Um, no side airbags, no front airbags, no thick doors etc etc but also it's because this car is just lightweight you're low you're in it you feel more connected than you do in a modern car the new m3 is a great car but it's gotten so big at this point that you just can't 
get the same experience. And no matter how much power you put in, a big car is a big car. You can't compensate for it and create something like this. All right, I'm gonna floor it here. It's not that it's slow, because it isn't slow, it's just not fast. But it does feel pretty fast because you're kind of in it. You're on the ground, the road's coming at you, you're just not all that insulated. The biggest thing to me about this car though is I just love how it steers. I love, love how connected this car feels when you're steering. Um, the steering is so good, it's so sharp, it's so magical. You just really feel like you're you're doing it, you're killing it. There's no electronic assist, there's no BS like that. And combine that with shifting the gears and feeling that glorious turn signal lever, you really feel like you're in a car that is made for a driver, that's what this is. Truthfully, the driving experience of this car is something that cannot easily be replicated, especially in the modern era. There are so many regulations you now have to follow in terms of safety and equipment that cars are basically regulated to be too heavy for this to exist. Um, I love the new M2 competition, but this just feels more connected. You just feel lower, you feel like you can just have a little bit more fun. Is this the best BMW ever made? I mean, I think a great argument could be made that the answer is yes. This was really the beginning of the lineage of all of the great modern sporty BMWs. And yet, unlike a lot of beginning of the lineage cars like the Corvette, um, this is fun to drive. It's still fun by modern standards. Not as fast as it could be, but it's so exciting to throw around. And you do see when you drive this car that although the new M3 is fantastic, there are some things that it lacks, like this small, kind of tossable, enjoyable quality that this car has so much. And so that's the E30 BMW M3. BMW has built some great cars in its history, and even though old school BMW enthusiasts scoff at modern BMW models, new cars like the X7 and the M2 competition prove that BMW is still building some excellent vehicles. But the E30 M3 was special in its own way. It's classic, it's an icon, and it has a driving experience which will probably never really be repeated by a modern car. It's one of my very favorite cars, and now it's time to give the E30 M3 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the E30 M3 is really excellent. I truly love those flared fenders, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in about 6.7 seconds, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Handling is sharp, excellent, but a bit slow by the standards of modern sports cars, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Fun factor is high. It really does have a go-kart feel, but ultimately it's a bit too slow to really earn a huge score here, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is excellent. These always turn heads, and they're the coolest early M car, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 28 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This one is pretty much what you'd expect given its age, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is also about what you'd expect, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is good. These aren't the most reliable cars, but they're easy to work on, and the interior is decent, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a car like this, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Value is a tough one. These have gone up in value quite a bit, but I still think there's more room to go, considering the amazing driving experience and this car's status as an important early M car. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 23 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 51 out of 100, which places it here against other performance cars from this era. The closest competitors on this list are the Delta Integrale and the 190E 2.316. The M3 destroys the 190E. It's simply better, period. But the Delta wins outright. It's an amazing car. But the E30 M3 is pretty special, too. <laughs> If you go onto the ceiling above the rear view mirror, you can see there's a little panel with various different, like, 